Okay, good morning again, everybody. Um, the first topic that we're going to discuss today is the topic of uh, convexity. So let me write convex functions. As with, as with many uh, situations, uh, this is another one where the terminology is not universal. So some people will call them convex functions and, w well, may maybe I'll define it. And then, we'll okay, so, so there are convex functions and there are concave functions and some, some people call them convex up and convex down or concave up and concave down. I'm going to call them convex and concave and but, but it's not, it, this is a non-issue, so don't let it confuse you. Okay, so before the formal definition, um, an informal definition, a convex function is a function that looks like this, for example. Okay, so you want it to be convex. I'll write what it means in a second. There are several competing definitions. But something like this, for example, is also convex, okay? And in fact, something like this is also convex, okay? So how do we define this notion precisely? So here's the definition. Definition. A function is called convex on some interval i if for all x and y in the interval the secant do you remember what a secant is? It's just a line connecting two points on the graph. So the secant connecting the point x, f of x, to the point y, f of y, is above the graph. So if you draw, if you take any two points here and draw the secant line connecting them, it's going to be above the graph. Likewise here, take any two points, draw the secant line, it's going to be above the graph. And this above is in the weak sense. So for example, if you take these two points, then the line connecting them is the graph. So we consider this to be above the graph. Okay, so this is above in the less than or equal to so a sense. So a, 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 um, a constant function, for example, is convex under this definition. Okay, you can maybe define something to be strictly convex if, if um, it's strictly above the graph. Okay, now the the... The opposite of this is what we're going to call concave. So a function is concave if for any two points the secant connecting them is below the graph. Okay? So Concave, maybe a way to remember this is that concave has the word cave in it, so it should remind you of something like this, okay? And if you use these two definitions, you can't get confused. If you use concave up and concave down, you can't get confused either. Concave, well, down's the cave and concave up, whatever that means. If you use convex up and convex down, I don't know what the intuition to that would be, but this is the terminology we're going to use. Okay, so note one important thing. We did not require any notion of differentiability in this definition. So this is defined even if the function is not necessarily differentiable. It could have these cusps, and that's fine. Okay, the definition stems from a more general discussion of what is a convex 
set, but we're not going to get into that. But we want to somehow encode this in terms of differentiability, because that's how we study functions. We, we study their differentiability properties. So this is the next uh, theorem. Maybe we'll give a couple of examples first. So example, so if you look at the function sine of x, so what does sine of x looks, look like? Sine of x looks like this, as you all know. So is it convex or concave? Right, depends on the interval. So for example, on 0 pi, on 0 pi, this is 0, this is pi, this is 2 pi. On 0 pi, it's what? Right, sine x is concave. Whereas on pi, 2 pi, sine x is convex. Okay? So this is a property of a function on an interval. It's not a pointwise property like differentiability or continuity. Okay? It's a property of an interval. Okay? What about, for example, x squared? I can't believe I'm still drawing x squared, but why not? What about x squared? Right, it's convex on R. Convex on all of the real line. Okay, so here are some theorems. I'm not going to prove them. I'm just going to argue them intuitively. They're easy to, to believe. So the first theorem is the following. Suppose f is differentiable. If it's not differentiable, we can't encode things in terms of differentiability. But suppose it is on some interval, let's say a, b. Then f is convex if and only if the graph is above the tangent line at any x0 in the interval. So the picture that goes along with this, think of a convex function. So we're going to draw something convex. If the function is convex and differentiable, so if it's differentiable, we can, it has a derivative at any point, so it has a tangent line at any point, so take a point, draw the tangent line, the tangent line is going to be below the graph. Can you believe that? Okay, so this is you can define a convex function like this, but only for differentiable functions, right? If the function is not differentiable, this is no longer qualifies as a definition, okay? Okay, here's another theorem. Theorem. Maybe... Maybe we'll do this theorem. Okay, let's let's save some space. Theorem. So suppose f is differentiable on AB. Then one, f is convex if and only if the graph is above the tangent line at any point. And two, f is convex if and only if f prime, maybe you can tell me, what does f prime have to satisfy for a convex function? Let's look at the picture. So f prime encodes the slopes of the tangent lines, right? 
So think of a point here. Here's the slope of the tangent line. Do you see that? And now when you move along the axis, here's the slope, here's the slope, here's the slope, here's the slope. What do you see? Right, the slopes are increasing. Do you see that? Okay, so if you take a point here, the slope might even be negative. And then as you move along, the slopes become bigger and bigger. So f prime is increasing. Okay? Good? Okay. And of course, if you, if you re replace convex with concave, then the statements are going to change accordingly. So here it's going to be below, and here it's going to be decreasing. That's obvious, right? Okay. The next theorem, we're going to take the smoothness of f one step up. So suppose f is twice differentiable on AB. Then, so twice differentiable means that it has the second derivative at any point. Then f is convex if and only if the previous theorem says that f prime is increasing. Okay? How does that how do, how does that reflect in f prime prime? Right, f prime prime has to be positive. Right? In order for f prime to be increasing, its derivative f prime prime has to be positive. Okay? or maybe non-negative, because we are allowing the... Okay. Does everybody agree? Yep? Can you explain why, if the second derivative is positive, the first derivative is going to be increasing? That's a theorem we had a long time ago. Well, last week, for example. If the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. So if f prime prime is positive, f prime, which is the function for which f prime prime is the derivative, is increasing. Okay? Okay. And here's another theorem, which again is very easy to believe. Assume that f is convex and differentiable on AB. So we're taking a function that is convex and differentiable. Let x0 be a critical point of f. What can you say about that critical point? Can you classify it? Think of a convex function. It has to be a minimum. Do you agree? Then x0 is a minimum. OK? So if you take a convex function, it's just picture it, convex function take a critical point, that point is going to be a minimum. Good? Okay. And now, there's a definition of a term which you probably have met before. X0 is called an, oh, maybe not an, a point of inflection, or an inflection point, a point of inflection of F if F is convex on one side 
of x0 and concave on the other side. Okay, now there's, there are, I'm going to add one thing which is not always added, but I am going to add it to the definition. I'm going to require f to be continuous at x0. Okay, you can talk about points of inflection. So a point of inflection is a point where the function changes from being convex to being concave, right? Or vice versa. You can talk about such points even when for example, the function is not continuous. Suppose it's concave here and convex here and it has a jump here. You can still call that a point of inflection. And some people do. I'm going to rule that out for our definition. It's just a matter of making a decision. So x0 is called a point of inflection of f if, let's add, f is continuous at x0 comma, and convex on one side, and concave on the other side. So an example, let's take a new board for this. Oh, example, sine x. Right there it is on the board. Wow, I'm going to use that. So example, remember we had sine x, which was concave on 0 pi and convex on pi 2 pi. Therefore, the point pi itself is a point where it changes from being convex to being concave, right? So pi is a point of inflection. Good? Okay. Now, the last theorem we had, the last theorem we had, let's look back at the board with the definition. The last theorem we had said the following. No, this theorem, the second to last theorem. A function is convex if and only if the derivative is non-negative. Okay? So if you want it to be convex on one side, the, derivative, the second derivative has to be non-negative on one side. If you want it to be concave on the other side, the second derivative has to be non-positive on the other side. So what does it mean about the point itself? Zero. Right. So at the point itself, the second derivative is going to be zero. zero. Is that always the case? Why not? There is a theorem. Hmm? Okay, that's one thing. So you can have a function, you could have a function which is not necessarily even twice differentiable, right? If it's not twice differentiable, then this theorem just fails to, to, to say anything because this doesn't exist, right? You can still talk about being convex and being concave, right? So is that the only reason? Suppose f is twice differentiable. Wait, 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 wait. Suppose f is twice differentiable, okay? In that case, can you say that the definition of a point of inflection is f prime prime equals zero? Would that be the definition? Why not? Well, for a constant function, a constant function is convex at any, at, on any interval, and simultaneously, it's concave on any interval, so you can call any point a point of inflection, since we defined it the way we did. Okay, so let's write this. Remark remark, important remark, the definition is not f prime prime at x0 equals 0. 
It's not that. And examples, the first example is a function which simply uh, doesn't have a derivative at some point. Okay, so the function can be, for example, something like this maybe, and then something like, uh, I don't know, something like, what am I doing? Black functions. Ooh. Functions are blue. And he's right there in my hand. Wow. So here's, what did I just draw? Convex, right? And then maybe here it's not differentiable at this point. And here it's concave. So this point right here could be a point of inflection, but the function's not differentiable there, let alone twice. Okay, so that definition is not going to hold. That's the easy observation. But moreover, moreover, so this would be example one, where f prime prime at zero is not does not exist. Does not exist. Although zero is an inflection point. But another example, example two, look at x to the power four. This is x to the power four. What can you say about the second derivative of this function at the point zero? What's f prime prime at zero? So f prime is four x cubed, right? f prime prime is 12x squared. f prime prime at 0 is what? 0. But 0 is clearly not a point of inflection. Right? This function is convex on all of R. Okay? So f prime prime at 0 is 0, but 0 is not a point of inflection because the de the second derivative does not change sign that's true okay so in no sense is this if and only if with having a point of inflection so this is a common error you have to be very careful with this okay you could say the one thing that you could say is that if a function is twice differentiable, then a point is a point of inflection if and only if the second derivative changes signs at that point. That is true. Okay? Clear? Is this discussion clear? Hmm? I can't hear you. You're mumbling. Raise your voice. Wait, 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 what does this have to do with being a minimum or a maximum? No, the, the, a point of inflection in no sense has to be a minimum or a maximum. The point pi here is a point of inflection. It's not a minimum, it's not a maximum, it's just a point. Okay, the first derivative there is not zero. So th this, is, this is a separate issue than, than... It is true that sometimes... Um, points which are picked up as being suspicious by the first derivative equaling zero, like the point zero in the function x cubed, which we drew several times last time, could end up being points of inflection. But being a point of inflection is not necessarily uh, a property only of points uh, which we called critical points, in, in no sense. Okay? This is a point of inflection, derivative is not zero, 
uh, wouldn't be picked up by such an argument. Okay? Good? Okay, so that's going back a bit. Maybe ask me about that about during the break. Okay? Okay. So what I want to do now, what I want to do now is take a function and study it from A to Z. Really explore it from beginning to end where the beginning is going to be very simple. Find uh, intercepts with the axes or find um, where it is continuous, where it is defined, what, it's, what is its domain. And the end, the ultimate goal of this is going to be to be able to graph the function, draw a reasonable, accurate sketch of the graph. Okay? And I'm not going to write this as a, as a full uh, theorem with steps and here's what you do or an algorithm or a recipe book. I'm just going to do one example. Okay? And that example is going to exhibit everything we want to do in general and the steps that you usually follow. You've seen this done before, I'm sure, but it's still worth doing at least one example. So, how do we graph a function? So, here's our example. The example I'm going to take is the following function. f of x equals x squared times 3 minus x. And all of this to the power one-third. Okay? Okay, let's get started. So the first step, step one, and, and th th this is not the, the, the order of the steps or naming the steps or how we exactly decide which belongs to which step is not something, you know, too strict. You can do it slightly differently. As long as you go through all these, all these little details, then, then that's what's important. So for me, the first step is going to be to decide what's the domain of the function. Where is it defined? At which points is it not defined? So when you look at this function, what is the domain of the function? Where is it defined? So what does it mean to the power one-third? Right, it's the third root, right? The, the function third root, do you remember what its graph looks like? Right, it's kind of arctanish, remember? And it's defined everywhere, right? It's defined for any x. These are defined for any x, so the domain of this function, as some people said here, is r. This function is defined everywhere. Does everybody agree? When can things go wrong in step one? Not in this example, but when can there be points which are not at the domain? For example, when you have uh, a square root, which is defined only for positive numbers. When you have ln, which is defined only for positive numbers. Whenever you have something in the denominator, it's not defined when it equals zero, right? Tangents is not defined at multiples of pi over 2. So there are various cases where functions are not defined and you have to be careful about those. Okay? Good? Questions? Okay. So here there's no issues. Step 2. Continuity. Look at this function and tell me where it is continuous and what points of discontinuity does it have. Don't look at me, look at the function. Right. Does everybody agree? 
He said that it's continuous everywhere. How do you know? Very good. This is an elementary function, right? It's the third root of a product of a polynomial and another polynomial. So this is an elementary function. Theorem, very important theorem because it saves us a lot of work. An elementary function is continuous on its entire domain where it's defined. Remember, this function is defined everywhere. It's continuous everywhere. Do you agree? So once again, this step for this example is easy. In general, in general, you can have situations where the function is not continuous. For example, if you take sine x over x, it's not defined at zero. Zero is not a, in its domain. It can be non-continuous there, depending on how you define it at zero. Okay? Or you can have functions that have jump discontinuous, especially when you have functions that are defined using cases. Remember, we had several of those examples. So whenever you have a function and uh, points of discontinuity, I would include in this step classifying the types of discontinuities that you have. Okay? So a full study of step two would say x equals 5 is a jump discontinuity, x equals 17 is a... And how do you, how do you classify them? How do you find what kind of discontinuities they are? Right, you have to calculate limits. Right? Everybody with me? Good? Okay, so again in this example, this step is easy and allows us to move right away to step three. Step three um, intercepts in intercepts is this how you spell it? Yes. With um, x and y with the axes so how do you find, and th th this step is, is always going to be rather easy, and it's not really a crucial step, it's just to make it easier to plot the graph. Okay, so we take two specific points that are kind of important because we always draw the axes. Okay, so how do you find where the function intercepts the y-axis? Right, when x is equal to zero, that's the intercept with the y-axis. So if x equals 0, you find, you plug in x equals 0, 0, x equals 0, 3, but 0 times 3 is 0, third root of 0 is 0, so you get the point y equals 0. In other words, you get the point 0, 0. Right? How do you find intercepts with the x-axis? Right, you said y equals 0, or f equals 0, and here there's usually a bit more to solve. It's not just plugging in a number. So you want this to be equal 0, right? When does this expression equal 0? This is a third root of something. It equals 0 if and only if what's written inside is 0, right? So this is a product, so in order to equal 0, at least one of them has to be 0. So either x is 0, which is this point, which we already know, or 3 minus x in, is 0, in which case x is, x is 3. So we get x equals 0 or x equals 3, well not or, and. And for x equals 0, we rediscover this point, and for x equals 3, we find another point, which is the point 3. Zero. Do you agree? So these are things you've done in high school or maybe even before preschool? Bless you. Everybody good? Questions? Okay. Good. So moving on to step four. So step four is the first um, step which is more
calculus ish well actually not i mean exploring the continuity can be uh can involve limits as we said and and can be more interesting for other examples but for our example the first interesting step is step four and step four is finding f prime and step two I want you to say where is it continuous and where it's not continuous what kinds of discontinuities it is okay okay step four um, derivative and we know that this is very important because many many properties of the function are reflected in its derivative Okay, so first of all, let's find the derivative. So I'm going to rewrite f itself in a way that is going to make it easier, for me at least, to find the derivative. I'm going to write it as x to the power 2 thirds times 3 minus x to the power 1 third. Do you agree that this is the same as f in the way I originally wrote it? Okay. And now finding the derivative doesn't involve a chain rule, it's just a simple product. Do you see that? So what is f prime? So f prime of x is the derivative of x to the two-thirds, which is what? Two-thirds x to the minus one-third times this factor without taking its derivative, right? Product rule for derivatives. And then plus x to the two-thirds untouched times the derivative of this factor, which is one-third three minus x to the power minus two-thirds times the inner derivative, which is negative one. So I'll just make this plus into a minus. Very easy to do on the board, slightly harder in your notebook if you're not using a pencil. Good questions about this? Okay. So finding derivatives is something you know how to do easily. Now there's a very important thing to say at this step. Very important. We said it before, but I'm going to say it again because it's very important. There is no theorem that says that an elementary function is differentiable everywhere. There is no such theorem. And there's no such theorem because it's wrong. Okay, So look what happened here. We took an elementary function, we followed very carefully the rules of differentiation, right? We just did the product rule and there was a little chain rule involved here, and we found f prime. But look, f prime, for example, here, this is x to the minus one-third, right? So it's one over x to the power one-third. At x equals zero, this is not defined. Do you agree? Note, f prime is not defined at x equals zero because you get this thing in the denominator and where else right here you have three minus x in the denominator if x equals three this thing is zero and it's again not defined this is very important okay now what we found here is that the formula that we found for f prime using rules of differentiation got us something which is not defined at these two points. That doesn't necessarily mean that f prime doesn't exist at those points. All it means, at least a priori, is that this formula doesn't hold at, that, at those points. Okay. In order to formally say that this is really the case, that it's really not that the derivative does not exist at those points, 
you have to calculate the derivatives by definition at those points and show that the limits that define the derivative don't exist at those points. That would be the fully formal way to do it. Okay? Good? So, in this case, it is the situation. The derivative does not exist at x equals 0 and at x equals 3. Okay, so be very, very careful is, with this. It's very tempting to follow a non-theorem that, like continuity, says, well, it's elementary. Then we can differentiate it. Mm -mm. Careful, careful. Okay, good, clear. Okay, I know that it's kind of warm and cozy here. If you're falling asleep, please go out, wash your face. Maybe I should do this. I'll, I'll be back soon. No, just kidding. Um, if you're falling asleep, I'm not looking at you, please do it. Okay? Thank you. F prime is not defined at x equals 0 and x equals 3. Okay. Now, what do we want to know about F prime? How do, how, why are we interested in F prime? Well, we want to know where the function is increasing or decreasing, right? And where, where the function has critical points. And how's that reflected in F prime? Right. We want to explore what we're really interested with respect to F prime is when is F prime positive, when is F prime negative, and when is F prime equal to zero. Do you agree? That tells us where we have critical points where the function is increasing and when the function is decreasing, right? Okay, so that is all part of uh, step four. So maybe we'll emphasize these points which have significance. So at x equals zero and x equals three, f prime is not defined. Okay, where is f prime? Let's say, where is f prime non-negative? In order for f prime to be non-negative, I want this entire expression to be non-negative. Do you agree? In other words, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I don't want to write tons of steps, so look here and tell me if you agree. I want this term to be greater than or equal to this term by moving this to the other side of the inequality. Do you agree? So I want two-thirds um, let, let me write it as, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite it as 3 minus x divided by x to the power 1 third. Do you agree that this and this are the same thing? I want that to be greater than or equal to, and this I'm going to rewrite as 1 third, and then x divided by 3 minus x to the power 2 thirds. Does everybody agree that this is what I want? This is if and only if f prime is greater than or equal to 0. Good? And it's obvious here why these two points, I have to rule them out. Good? Okay. Now, what do, how do I approach an inequality like this? I would want, I would wish, I could just multiply by, multiply both sides by x to the power one-third and by three minus x to the power two-thirds. Do you agree? Can I do that? Can I multiply both sides by x to the one-third? No. Why not? Right, I can, but it would change the inequality depending on, the, on whether x is positive or negative. Do you agree? What about this factor? Right, this is raised to the power two-thirds. So in particular, I'm first squaring it, making it always positive. So I can multiply by three minus x to the power two-thirds, and that's always positive. Do you agree? So the only thing I have to worry about is, is x positive or negative? So for x greater than 0, 
If x is greater than 0, in which case this is positive, I get, multiplying by x to the one-third both sides, I get here this disappears, and here I just get x. Do you see that? And here I'm multiplying by 3 minus x to the two-thirds, here, so I just get 3 minus x. So I get 2, well, I can cancel the, th the one-thirds on both sides as well. So I get 2 times 3 minus x is greater than or equal to, the inequality signs remains the same because it's positive, x. That's it. Do you agree? Yes? OK. And now I have to solve this. So what do I get? I get 6 minus 2x is greater than or equal to x. In other words, 6 is greater than or equal to 3x. In other words, x is less than or equal to 2. So this is for x positive. Good? Did everybody follow? Questions? OK. I multiplied both sides by x to the power one-third, which canceled this and made this x to the two-thirds just an x. Then I multiplied both sides by 3 minus x to the two-thirds, which is always positive, canceled this, and made this into just 3 minus x. Clear, everybody? OK. So for x equals 0, I get that this happens whenever x is less than or equal to 2. So this, this, the, 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 the satisfying both x equals 0 and x less than or equal to 2, I get the following domain, x greater than 0, less than or equal to 2. So this is a domain where f prime is non-negative. Do you agree? Okay. Now, where would f prime be non... Oh, 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 I, I'm not done. I still have to do um, when x is less than 0. When x is less than 0, I'd still get this. It would be the same, the same sort of multiplications but it would change the sign of the inequality, right? So for x less than 0, I would get exactly the same thing, but I would get here x greater than or equal to 2. Do you agree? So let's write that. So for x, for x less than 0, we get, following the same calculation, just changing the directions of the sign, we get x is greater than or equal to 2. So what's the domain that we get here? None. This cannot happen. No x's satisfy simultaneously that they're negative and greater than 2. Okay, so this, this gives us nothing new, impossible. Okay, and when is f prime less than or equal to zero? So that would be just solving the exact same thing with opposite signs, so you'd get the, the remaining uh, parts of the interval. So that would be when x is less than 0 and x is greater than or equal to 2, greater than or equal to 2, but not equal 3, because it's, it, it's 3 itself, it's not defined. Right? I have a question. Yep. What on the case that it's constant, the function at some point, 
The function is not constant. That's I the know, function. But on the case that is constant at one point and then it continues. So what's the question? If uh, a function is constant, its derivative is zero. No, not all the time. But it's on an interval is going to be constant. Uh huh. So it's not increasing and not decreasing at that point. We're we're just calculating the derivative. We didn't make any statements yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm just calculating whether the derivative is positive or negative. Okay. I'm saying that could be that the two of them have an interval together. What do you mean the two of them have an interval together? This when it's bigger than zero have an interval. They could have that the two of them are zero. Right. The, the way I wrote it, you can write it. You could write it. When is f prime just strictly greater than zero? And when is it equal to zero? And when is it less than or equal to zero? The points where, the way I wrote it, the points where it's equal to zero are the points where it satisfies both. Okay, so at which points would, would it satisfy an equality here? Which points what? Would it be equal to zero? Which points satisfy both? At uh, two. Exactly. And in, in different examples, it could be on more than one point or on entire intervals. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so in particular, f prime prime equals zero at x equals two. Okay, so let's summarize. Summarize. I'm going to call it step five. I'm going to call it step five. And I want to summarize this discussion in, in a certain way that I'm used to writing it. This is not the only, no, there are many ways to express this. This is the way I'm used to. I'm going to summarize this, the information that we accumulated in a certain little table here. And the table is going to be the following. I'm going to write f down here and f prime up here. And I'm going to allow this line to represent the x-axis. Okay, so the points that I'm um, that I found are more significant are the points zero, two, and three. And what I found is that for x is less than zero, f prime is uh, negative. At zero, it f prime does not exist. Between 0 and 2, that's on the previous board, we found that f prime was positive. At 2 itself, f prime, why did I write f prime prime? Sorry. Just f prime. Sorry about this. I hope it didn't confuse anybody. f prime is 0. And whenever we're bigger than 2, except at 3 itself, the derivative is negative again. And at 3 itself, it doesn't exist. So this is the picture for f prime. Okay? And how does it... What does it imply about f? What does it imply about f? When the derivative is negative, what do we know about the function? Decreasing, and I'm going to indicate that by drawing something like this. Decreasing. When the derivative is positive, it's increasing. When the derivative is negative, it's again decreasing. So I'm going to write two arrows here. And that's the information I have so far. Okay, so step five would be maybe I gave name to the previous steps. So... Um, um, let's call it monu to nicity. Where is it increasing and decreasing? So this is the picture that we get. Okay. And maybe let's draw here, let's draw here an inter intermediate drawing, a temporary drawing, just to show you that at this step we actually know a whole lot about the function already. We're not done. There are still steps that we have to do. We'll do those after the break. But I want to show you that we already know quite a lot. So 
let's see what we already know. So we know that it's continuous everywhere, so we're going to be able to draw it without lifting, lifting the marker off the board. We found that it has two roots at 0, 0, and at 3, 0. So this is 3, 2, 1, 0. Right? So at 3 and at 0, it has roots. And what else do we know? Well, we know it's decreasing on, on the negative part of the x-axis. So it's somehow going to come from down here, right? And it's not going to be too wiggly or too complicated because the derivative doesn't change sign there, right? So it can't go up and down because that would mean the derivative would change sign. It's just monotone. I still don't know if it's like this or like this. I don't know exactly. For that, I'm going to have to study convexity. That's going to be the next step. But I do know already that it somehow comes down like this. Somehow. This is not an accurate drawing yet. This is just a temporary drawing. Okay. Then what? Then it's going to go up all the way to x equals 2. So, and then it's going to go down again. So what's going to happen at x equals 2? It's going to be a maximum. Somewhere here at x equals 2, it's going to have a maximum. At x equals 0, it's going to have a minimum. The function is continuous. The derivative is changing sign. It's going to have a minimum here. So it's going to be something like this. I don't know exactly like what. We know because the, it's continuous, right? But the derivative is not defined there. So it's some sort of cusp here. Do you agree? And at 2, the derivative is defined. It is differentiable. There's not going to be a cusp here. It's going to pass through, in quote marks, pass through 2 smoothly. Do you agree? So the picture here, still, without doing further precise investigation, it's somehow going to be smoothish, not cuspish. OK, and then it's going to go down to 3, and then it's going to continue going down. Right? So here it's going to continue going down. I don't know exactly what happens at 3. It's continuous, but at 3, either there's some form of cusp, right? Or what could happen is the derivative could be infinity, okay? like, like the third root. And that's more likely here, because that's this function. It's a third root of something. So it's just going to pass through this point with an infinite slope. In, in, again, in quote marks. But this is a temporary picture, so let's call it a temporary uh, temp. You all have a temp folder on your computer, right? So this is a temporary picture, and when we draw the full picture, you'll see that we're actually very, very close already. Okay, most of the of the um, macro information has already been revealed. There's still some micro details that will be clarified when we do the, the next steps. Okay? So let's take a 10-minute break here, and we'll continue this after the break.